Hi, and welcome to a lecture on the mutual impedance between pairs of dipoles. The situation we'd like to consider in this lecture is this one here, where we have two dipoles, and we're interested in the mutual impedance between those two dipoles. Here we're indicating mutual impedance as the quantity Z sub 2, 1, which in this case is the voltage, V2, appearing on the terminals of the second dipole, in response to current I1 applied to the terminals of the first dipole, and not just in any old case, but rather the case specifically where the current on the second dipole is zero. In other words, the second dipole is open-circuited. So before we begin, some caveats. First, we are treating a case where the radii of the dipoles is much less than the length of the dipoles and much less than the wavelength. So we refer to this as uh, the thin dipole case, but thin in a very particular sense that the radii are less than both the length and the wavelength. Also, we're interested specifically in the case where the dipole axes are aligned in the same direction as indicated here, where you see that the axes of the dipoles are parallel. That doesn't mean the dipoles themselves are arranged in echelon, for example, and it doesn't mean necessarily the dipoles are arranged collinearly. Uh, any of those possibilities is allowed here, just as long as the axes are parallel. So, this is one of the rare cases where an expression for mutual impedance between two antennas exists. Although the expression I'm going to show you here is approximate, I'll say in what manner it's approximate in a moment, and it's also going to be an integral form, meaning you typically have to do a numerical integration to get a result. Nevertheless, the expression is quite useful uh, for analyses of arrays consisting of dipoles, and also gives you some insight into how mutual coupling works generally for any kind of antenna, but perhaps a little bit more on that later. The method we're going to consider is called the induced EMF method. Here, EMF refers to electromotive force, which is another somewhat archaic term for potential or for voltage. But the induced EMF method is the name of this method. And in this method, what you do is you apply a current to the first dipole, because remember, we need an I1 here to determine mutual impedance. And then next we find the electric field intensity, E sub 1, which is radiated by dipole number 1 when we do that. So current I1 is applied to dipole 1, it radiates, it produces this electric field intensity, E sub 1. And here's where the approximation comes in. When we compute this electric field, it's already quite complicated, especially since we need it in the near field, not merely in the far field. So the expression we get will be in the absence of dipole number 2. So the electric field that we compute presumes that the dipole number one is by itself in the universe and dipole two doesn't exist. So this is an approximation, although generally we find that this is a very, very good approximation, even when the dipoles are quite close together. The third step, we find the induced potential V sub two, assuming dipole number two is open circuited, as is required by the definition of mutual impedance that we've given above. And then finally, the mutual impedance we seek will be the quantity V2 that we calculated, divided by I1, which we impressed into the problem. And we'll note that the final result will depend only on materials and geometry, just like most traditional impedances do. It will not depend on I sub 1, because that'll cancel. I sub 1 appears in the denominator here, and it'll turn out that V sub 2 is proportional to I sub 1, so the result should not depend on the stimulus. This is another way of saying that the problem should be linear, and it is. So here is the result when we go through that exercise, skipping past all the electromagnetics, skipping past all the details of the method of solution. I'll simply show you the solution, and it consists of this integral. Now, the integral consists of two factors, the first factor being this thing, the sine of beta, beta being the phase propagation constant, 2 pi over lambda, multiplied by this factor. And you should recognize this as being the current on a dipole. This is a general expression for the current on a dipole, and specifically the current on the dipole when it's transmitting. 
So if we apply some current to a dipole, we expect to see a current distribution on that dipole that has this form. And this is a very general form that applies regardless of the length of the dipole, as long as it's thin. This thing over here, E sub Z, is proportional to the Z hat component of E sub 1. That is, it's proportional to the Z hat component, the component that's parallel to the dipole, of the field that's being radiated by dipole 1 in the absence of dipole 2. Now, that expression, E sub Z, is given down here. I'll say a little bit more about that when the time comes. The integral that we're doing is over the length of dipole number 2. So here is dipole number 2. This is a point at which we are currently at. And to do the integration, we're going to start down here and consider each point walking up the length of the dipole. As we do that, these lengths indicated here, R prime, R1 prime, and R2 prime, these functions will change. So they're primed to indicate that they depend on the current position that we're considering within the integral. So prime coordinates are things which are varying as we integrate. Now this form, where we have something to do with a current in the transmit mode multiplied by a receive electric field, this should not be surprising to you that the mutual impedance takes this form. And the reason is, is because you may recall that the far field result for the open circuit potential induced at a dipole is that it is equal to the instant electric field intensity dot product with the vector effective length. And the vector effective length is given by the integral over the dipole, assuming a current distribution in the transmit mode. So this expression up here that we've come up with for mutual impedance is simply a generalization of this idea, where this idea applies only for far field conditions, whereas this thing has been determined even in the near field. And that's why this E sub Z thing looks a little bit complicated. So now let's talk about that. Here is this E sub Z, which is a function of Z prime. In other words, it's changing as we integrate along the length of the dipole. And it consists of three terms. The first term being this one, which is very clearly a spherical wave term. And it's associated with something coming off the end of this dipole here. The second term is again a spherical wave term. And in that case, it is something coming off the end of the dipole here. The third term is a little bit more complicated, but it also includes a spherical wave factor. In this case, a spherical wave factor originating from the center of that dipole. The difference is that now we have this cosine factor, a 2, and we subtract. So the key idea here is that this is proportional to the z component of the radiated electric field that we expect. And that's all there is to it. It just turns out that this component can be expressed in terms of a spherical wave off the two ends of the dipole, and then another one which originates from the center. It is worth noting that in the special case where the first dipole is lambda by 2, we have a simplification, and that's because beta times the length of that dipole divided by 2 can be calculated in advance. That's 2 pi over lambda for the phase propagation constant. Lambda by 2, that's the length of L1. And then divided by 2, that gives you pi over 2. So pi over 2, appearing as the argument of cosine here, gives you 0. So as a result, the third term in that special case turns out to be 0. So if you're dealing with half-wave dipoles, this gives you a nice computational speed up. It's also worth noting that if the dipoles are in the far field of each other, which is, I should emphasize, not usually the case in arrays, but you might consider this anyways just to see how the expression's working, then this factor E sub z for a half-wavelength dipole reduces to this expression, which again is a spherical wave dependence, at least spherical wave in the magnitude, spherical wave in the phase dependence only approximately. It's the sum of these two things. But the rays associated with R1 prime and R2 prime are going to be approximately parallel. So this is pretty close to being a spherical wave. And that's what we expect. A final important comment here, since you'll typically have to numerically integrate 
this expression. Since this expression typically requires numerical integration, you must be very, very careful. And I will warn you in advance, and you can find this out just by doing the experiment, that the increment delta z, which you break the integral up into little parts of length delta z, that delta z must be much, much, much less than a wavelength. And that's because the integrand varies very quickly with respect to a wavelength. So don't think you can just break this up into one-tenth of a wavelength chunks and uh, make this work. And typically the dz here has to be much less than a tenth of a wavelength even. Okay, so now some findings. Uh, two canonical cases here that you might consider, two cases of great importance, one being where we have half-wavelength dipoles, and they are in echelon, as we say. They're parallel, but not only parallel, but they are aligned so that their center points where they're being fed are uh, in a line as shown indicated here. And then we can compute the mutual impedance, z sub 2, 1, as a function of this distance. This distance could go anywhere from zero, meaning the two dipoles are on top of each other, to being uh, infinite, which means the dipoles would be infinitely far away. And what we find is that the mutual impedance, that is its real and imaginary parts, are as indicated in this plot, this plot showing the spacing between the dipole axes as a, in wavelengths, in units of wavelengths, and here is the impedance of the real and imaginary parts in ohms. Uh, and what you see is that generally what happens is that the mutual impedance between the dipoles decreases with increasing separation. This should not be surprising, right? Because for any constant excitation, you would expect that the induced voltage on the other dipole would decrease with increasing distance. And that's what this shows, the envelope of this response is falling off with increasing distance. Something else to note here is that the result that we've come up with converges to the self-impedance of a single dipole when the separation goes to zero. In other words, as we decrease the separation and we get to zero, that means the two dipoles are on top of each other. In that case, we see the real part is about 73 ohms, and we see the imaginary part is about 42.5 ohms, and that's the self-impedance of a thin dipole. So this also makes sense. We expect that when the, that the mutual impedance for two dipoles, which are close to each other, converges to the self-impedance of a single dipole. And that is, in fact, the case. The second canonical case that we'd like to consider is dipoles which are arranged collinearly, as indicated here, where they are not only parallel, but along the same axis. In this case, we will vary the separation between the dipoles. Now, obviously the separation can't go to zero because that would correspond to varying lengths of the dipole arms overlapping each other. And the expression that we came up with is not valid for that case. So we'll start here at 0 0.5 wavelengths, which is as close as we can put these two things together without having those overlapping dipole arms. So 0 0.5 wavelengths corresponds to the case where the tips are touching. And then we can increase spacing as far as we want beyond that. And what we see in that case is that generally, the mutual impedance is much smaller than it is for the parallel arrangement. If we compare these two curves, and these plots are to the same scale, we see that the mutual impedance quickly dies off. It starts off lower, and it quickly dies off further beyond that point. So this could also be anticipated, right? You know that the field of a dipole, at least in the far field, has a null along the axis. should not be surprising that we see that this magnitude response rolls off much quicker and starts off smaller. So you might summarize all of this by saying that dipoles in echelon, as in the top case, have relatively strong mutual impedance, whereas dipoles in collinear arrangement have relatively low mutual impedance. And that, that is true. That concludes this lecture on mutual impedance of pairs of dipoles.